hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for our first virtual uh, seminar of the Great Lakes Seminar Series, co-hosted by the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory and the University of, University of Michigan's Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research. Uh, my name is Mary Ogdahl, and I am the Program Manager for Sigler. I have the pl pleasure of introducing our speaker today, uh, who is Dr. Aaron Fisk. He is Professor and Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in, change, in Changing Great Lakes Ecosystems in the School of Environment in Great Lakes and the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research, or GLIR, at the University of Windsor. His research is focused on animal movements and food webs, mainly in the Great Lakes, but also in the Arctic and tropical marine environments. He has over 250 career journal publications and more than 14,500 citations on Google Scholar. In his 12 years at the University of Windsor, he has secured more than $23 million in direct funding, including the recently funded Real-Time Aquatic Ecosystem Observation Network, or RAON. He recently held a Pew Fellowship in Marine Conservation on integrating Inuit fishermen into management of fish stocks. Uh, before I turn it over to Aaron to get started on his presentation, I will ask everyone to please leave your microphones muted and enter any questions that you may have into the chat box. We have a couple of um, us on the uh, webinar today who will be monitoring those questions. And at the end of the presentation, we'll read those to be answered by Aaron. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Aaron Fisk. Let's make sure he's unmuted. Can you hear me, Mary? Go ahead, Aaron. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mary. And, and thank you to Glural and Sigler for arranging and inviting me uh, for the seminar. Um, I hope everybody and your families are healthy and you're all trying to stay sane out there. And thanks for attending the meeting. Um, before we wander off and do other things during these virtual meetings, I, I need to start by um, talking and or thanking the people that have contributed to what I'm going to present today. And so this is a, a, a incomplete list, I'm sure, of people that I've, I've had the fortune to work with um, over the last 12 to 14 years on Great Lakes food webs um, throughout Canada and the United States. Um, the people at the top that are underlined uh, particularly uh, um, and gave me specific stuff that you're going to see today. And then the names in brown are graduate students and postdocs that I've had the pleasure of, of supervising in my lab over the last 10 or so years. I also want to acknowledge funding agencies and in particular, um, although they're not listed, um, the work that we've been doing in the Great Lakes has involved a lot of collaborations and, and collections of samples by ONMRF and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS and, and all their efforts. So a lot of funding and effort has gone into the data and samples that you're going to be seeing today. So um, I think we all know what food webs are. Uh, food webs are a uh, representation of the trophic relationships of, of what is eaten and, and by whom um, across an ecosystem. Um, if we look at these uh, excellent figures that we've all seen from Lake Ontario uh, and Lake Erie that are produced by NOAA and, and the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, you can see that they step up from the lower trophic levels like phytoplankton up to different trophic levels like zooplankton, forage fish and, and, and top uh, trophic level predators and that there's a very a variety of um, sources of these primary productivities from more benthic organisms to more pelagic. This idea of categorizing food webs has really been a central tenant in, in, in ecology uh, since the 1920s, for more than 100 years when Elton published some of his famous work on how the amount of biomass and stuff transfers through food webs. But you know, the Great Lakes, is, as we all know, is unique. Uh, they're very large. And um, really, they, they form a continuum from the smaller lakes up to the bigger oceans. And so they have a lot of characteristics of smaller lakes, but they also have a lot of characteristics of oceans, tides, such as these kinds of things that really make them quite complex. And, and a majority of what we know about freshwater food web really comes from research and work done in the smaller lakes. Um, the complexities and, and the habitat patchiness that we see in the Great Lakes has really hampered our ability to even do research there, but, but more importantly, understand the basic fundamentals and processes that drive them. And, and Jessica, um, I uh, published a paper about two years ago that sort of summarized what we know about Great Lakes 
uh, food webs. And, and really, one of the main conclusion was we sort of have an inadequate understanding of what goes on. I would also argue that a lot of the research that we have done on Great Lakes food webs has really been more focused on fish. And, and what I'm going to present today are some lower trophic level research that we've been doing. Within uh, Jessica's paper is, is a really is a summary of sort of what we think about with food webs and sort of gives you a structural component to it. If you look at the top um, part of this figure, you can see that we have functional groups and the light green would be more pelagic, the more brown would be uh, more benthic. Circles are, are species and then these arrows represent flows of energy and biomass through these food webs. And generally, when we talk about food webs, we talk about different trophic levels. And the first one is usually your primary producers or your base of your food web. Um, so you can have pelagic or um, pelagic uh, photosynthesis with algae all the way down to your benthic algae and benthic reworking of, of, of material. If we think about flows within habitats, we can talk about different trophic levels. And there's characteristics that are consistent across all food webs on planet Earth. Generally, as you move up food webs, you have less biomass, you have less species, and you generally see movement of energy up through these, although there is also detrital loop that comes in here. And then if we look at flows among habitats, generally as you move up food webs, the higher you go, the more um, habitats they're coupling and using. And these things are modified by natural modifiers, such as weather event and riverine and atmospheric input, um, and human modifiers. Certainly, we can't get away from our influence on the planet, so things like aquatic invasive species, which we've accelerated, nutrient loadings, which are big issues in the Great Lakes, and of course, the omnipresent climate change. And those can have different effects and things that happen in the structure of food webs. And we need to understand these things um, so that we can better understand food webs. Within uh, Jessica's paper, there's a whole bunch of, oops, there's a whole bunch of um, uh, knowledge gaps and things that we need to know about food webs. And, and they flow from things like basic knowledge to applied knowledge. So an example of a basic knowledge sort of unknown uh, flow within system is the importance of micro macroalgae as a basal resource in nearshore habitat. So this is talking about some of the Clodophora um, growths that we've seen in, in different Great Lakes. Uh, we don't really know how that impa impacts food webs or how that flows into food webs. And then you can go to more applied knowledge stuff, uh, such as example of flow within systems. Um, in this case, it would be harmful algal blooms, for example, in Lake Erie. What are the impact of harmful algal blooms on food webs? And on a bigger sense of things, this lack of knowledge of sort of the way the Great Lakes food web works um, is a problem enough, but we're seeing such rapid change now um, that we need to better understand these things. And, and, and we're sort of behind schedule now. We, you know, we don't have that basic knowledge and now things are changing. But really, in order to manage the resources, the valuable resources of the Great Lakes, we need to understand these things, we need to be able to quantify these things, and we need to be able to inform managers about how things are changing or what we might need to think about as things change in the future. For this talk today, I'm going to focus on two, really one area, lower trophic food webs, and I'm going to start by looking at variation um, and trophic levels across the five Great Lakes with some research that we're doing, and then look within Lake Erie and look at more specific species relationships later in the talk. And so um, the, the reason that I can present this data and do this data is, is because of my relationship with Tim Johnson and the cooperative relationship that the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, ONMRF, and the University of Windsor has had. So almost from the time that I showed up at the University of Windsor in 2006, I developed a relationship with Tim Johnson and we've been doing food web uh, research across the Great Lakes. And this figure on the bottom, and I'm gonna get to Annie Schofield in just a minute, but she made this figure. Um, the idea behind a lot of what Tim and I have been trying to do is, is to look at differences in food web relationships across the five Great Lakes, but also in ecoregions. And we've broken Erie into, although not for this talk, into different regions because they're so different. Um, and what this has allowed us to do is sort of twofold ideas here. One is that because the Great Lakes are so variable and we have different processes going on, if we study how these vary across the Great Lakes, then we can get into the mechanisms and processes that structure food webs so we contribute to basic knowledge and ecology. But also, too, by looking at these different systems, we can help management and conservation efforts respond to the different areas within the Great Lakes. 
And although we've had grants before 2013, Great Lakes Fishery Commission and stuff, we really started to utilize the Cooperative Science and Monitoring Initiative, CSMI, that goes on in the Great Lakes. So I'm sure most of you know that every year there's a, a Great Lake is chosen as a CS, CMSI year. It rotates between all five Great Lakes, and there's a more intensive effort to do collaborative research and do more sampling. And we've used these opportunities to do extensive sampling. So, for example, 2013, 2018, CMSI was in Lake Ontario. What this has allowed Tim and I to do is collect literally thousands, tens of thousands of samples that we have analyzed for stable isotopes, and we've developed uh, collaborations, and we've written our own papers up to do this, and a lot of what you're going to see uh, is from this. And we sort of have a strategy where we try to pick functional groups or species, so forage fish, zooplankton, benthic invertebrate predators, and ecoregions within the five Great Lakes. And our strategy has mainly been to use stabilized stuffs of carbon and nitrogen, and that's what I'll be showing today. Um, but also we've started to get into sulfur, although I'm not going to talk much about it today. Real quick on stable isotopes, again, I think most of you uh, understand how stable isotopes work, um, but all elements that um, in, in the environment exist as, as more than one isotope, they're stable, they don't break down, and these, the relative ratio of these things changes in a predictable way through, a fairly predictable way, uh, through ecosystems and across food webs, and, and because we know a little bit about how they change, then we can use this as a trace of ecological processes. It's probably had its biggest impact on understanding food webs because we know um, that um, as N15 moves from food to a consumer, um, so in this case, food is moving to a fish, that you're going to see an increase in delta N15. And this increase is called the diet tissue discrimination factor or trophic discrimination factor. And we can be fairly confident about what that number is, although I'm going to get back to that later. Carbon doesn't change so much between food and, and, and the consumer, but what it does do is it varies quite a bit, delta 13C, between different habitats from aquatic systems. So it tends to be much lower in pelagic systems and higher in benthic systems. And if we put these things together, and in this case, I'm showing a marine food web, delta N15 increases as you move up trophic levels. So you can use the delta N15 to estimate the trophic position or trophic level of an organism. And then we see that carbon varies from a lower value in the more pelagic zone to a value in the more benthic zone. And generally, as you move up food webs, which I talked about on one of the first slides, you sort of get this triangle uh, shape where the higher trophic level organisms are incorporating carbon and energy from different ecosystems or habitats, pardon me. So again, in the in fresh water in the Great Lakes, uh, most common use are carbon and nitrogen. So phytoplankton in the Great Lakes tend to be around minus 30 to minus 24. They're 13C depleted or light. And whereas benthic algae, for example, is going to be more enriched. So if I'm a fish eating benthic algae, then I should have a higher delta 13C than a fish that's eating pelagic algae. And we can put these things all together to look at overall food web structure and look at trophic relationships where some fish like alewife are going to be more focused in on the pelagic pathway, whereas benthic organisms are going to have a delta 13C. And generally, the higher the N15, the higher the trophic level. But one of the key things to doing anything with stable isotopes really in a food web is you need to understand the baseline variation. And so that's going to be part of my talk today. So the first talk um, is uh, work that's being done by Annie Schofield. And you can see her information down here on the bottom. She, some of the slides you're going to see here, she presented at Agler a few, uh, this year, the virtual meeting in June. Uh, Annie was a postdoc with Paris um, um, Collinsworth and, and Thomas Hook at Purdue, and she now has a permanent job at US EPA, so that's great. And she's been looking at the stable isotope data that we and they have collected across the Great Lakes. So again, the data that Tim and I collected provide an opportunity to contribute to Annie's postdoc. And so I'm going to use the work that she did to sort of show some of the relationships we uh, see across these different uh, food webs. And there's really three key research questions to, to the work that Annie's doing. Um, the first is, is that there is, um, is there any significant difference in the baseline 13C and 15N that can be related to the, the characteristics of the lake, trophic state, size of the lakes, and, and can that provide some information on what's going on? Are there consistent seasonal variations in stable isotopes across, across these lakes? We know that they vary across season. Is there any consistency? And then if we bring this together, um, 
are there uh, across lake or seasonal differences that we can imply about trophic level relationships and what's going on in the different ecosystems and things to consider when you're trying to manage these systems as they change. So she focused on uh, two baseline species, so zooplankton or filtered water um, to 62 microns, I think. And they're a mix of different zooplankton and potentially phytoplankton, some other things. Um, one of the problems when you work in freshwater ecosystems are is that zooplankton are very small. So a lot of times separating them, it takes a lot of meticulous work and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then we have benthic invertebrates that were collected uh, across the Great Lakes. And you can see the large sample size, almost a thousand zooplankton from the five lakes and almost 300 benthic invertebrates. And then we focused on rainbow smelt and lake trout for Andy's work because we had good samples of these all across the Great Lakes. And we had more than 1,200 samples of rainbow smelt and over 1,000 of lake trout. And so Annie used this data set to look at these trophic relationships. So what do we see? Well, the first thing, if we look at delta 13C and the zooplankton, you can see there's quite a relationship between uh, Superior down to Erie. And so as you move from Lake Superior to Lake Erie, uh, you can see that the delta 13C value in the zooplankton gets a lot higher and is significantly higher um, than it is in Superior. Similar trends in rainbow smelt, although not quite as, as consistent. Um, and then if we look across season, again, we see seasonal changes um, as we move through these systems. Um, things tend to be quite pelagic in the, in the spring, um, become a little bit more benthic and, and, and then decline again. And, and what we're seeing here is, is that we see generally consistent uh, trophic states between the different systems, but that we see different values. And we also see uh, changes in, in productivity, which affect um, uh, the stable isotopes that you see at the lower trophic levels. If we move to Delta N15, um, as you move from Superior Area, you see a pretty drastic change in Delta N15. So if you collect the same species or the same basic uh, e uh, group, eco group, you're going to see very different Delta N15 between Superior and, and Erie. Um, the reason for that probably is just the trophic state and, and what goes on. I think in Erie and Ontario, you're getting a lot of the anthropogenic input that comes down the system, particularly in Erie because it's shallower, you're getting more of a benthic. Um, or even the total signature uh, in the zooplankton. Um, we see similar trends in, in benthos, although not quite as, as strong as we see in, in, in zooplankton. So that tells us there's an environmental factor. And these are also displayed by trout, or the rainbow smell. So when you look across systems, you're going to see very different stable isotopes in the baseline. And you need to think about this as, as you compare between different species, um, for example, predators and lake trout between these systems. If we look at season again, um, what we see with delta N15 and zooplankton is a, a big reduction in delta N15. And this has been seen for at least 20 years in the Great Lakes. What you find is when you sample in the spring when they're coming off the winter when it's earlier, you tend to see more omnivorous uh, zooplankton such as acalanine copepods, and they have a higher delta N15 because of their feeding. I also think it might be a little bit to do with overwintering and starvation. And then as algal blooms occur and you get a lot of pelagic primary productivity, uh, they start to feed and you get more species that are herbaceous and your delta 13 or delta 15 N signature of the zooplankton changes and goes down. Now this is largely to do with the species that we're seeing, but as you're going to see later, it's just a trend that occurs in, in the Great Lakes, even when you look at individual species. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the organisms are feeding differently. It just means that the stable isotope signatures in the system um, are, are, are also changing. You need to consider this. These kinds of trends were consistent across the Great Lakes, which is, which is cool. It means that the mechanisms and processes that are driving them, which we still need to do some work on, are occurring. And then if we look at the rainbow cell, we see similar relationships um, that we see with zooplankton. It's a little bit delayed in, in rainbow smelt, and that probably has a little bit to do with the individual feeding behavior of the rainbow smelt, also the size of the rainbow smelt. They turn over ice stuff's a little bit slower, so they're lagging a little bit behind. And that's another thing you need to think about when you're looking at stabilized stuffs. So um, moving on to more specific um, and looking within Lake Ontario, this is the work of Don Yerzarski, who's a new master's student working with Tim and I. And part of uh, Don's work is to look back at a large data set we have from the 2013 and a little bit of the 2012, so the 2013 CMSI in Lake Ontario. And during that time, 
Uh, we had a really um, detailed effort to collect uh, individual zooplankton species across different ecoregions and different depths to try to get a handle on really how important is space and depth in species when you're looking at zooplankton stable isotope data. And so, as you can see, we have quite a few species here, and you can see the sample numbers that we have. Um, these guys are small. I, I cut my teeth on food web work in the, in the Arctic Marine where zooplankton was big. So a copepod was about the size of a rice, and you could, you, could, you could sort them to species by eye. We don't have that luxury in, in freshwater systems, and a lot of these zooplankton are really small. Stable isotopes require a very small sample uh, to, to be analyzed, but in reality, for these small zooplankton, you need a lot of them. So for some of the smaller species like Daphne, if you want an individual sample stable isotope, you're going to have to sort 25, 50, or even 75 individuals to get a single sample. So this data set right here represented a monumental effort um, to collect these samples. Um, and it's a fairly unique data set, I think, of really maybe potentially anywhere in, the, in, in any freshwater ecosystem in the world. Uh, what Don has done is he's organized them into sort of three, four groups of colors. So particular organic matter, which is a filtered water, is green. You can see it down here. It's the most pelagic based on delta 13C. It has a lower delta N15 value. Blue is what we consider to be, although we could debate this, a pelagic zooplankton. Brown is benthic invertebrates, and then red are forage fish, so alewife, slimy sculp, and deepwater sculp, and round goby and rainbow smell. A lot of this data has been published already by James Mumby. And as expected, you sort of see the, the lower delta 13C for the, for the uh, zooplankton, a little bit higher for the benthic invertebrates. But what these circles represent is what are called isotopic niches. And so they take all the data and they calculate a niche based on about 40% of the data. So this core area, this circle for this dark blue, which in this case, I believe it's uh, calanoid uh, copepods, but it represents its essential feeding niche based on delta 13C and delta 15N. And so when you have overlap of these niches, it means that these, these species are likely feeding on similar things. Um, and if you have differences between them, it means they're feeding on different different things. And so what you get is the benthic guys are falling out where you expect them, the pelagic are, are falling out over here, and the fish are falling out sort of on top of it. But there is a lot of overlap uh, within these species. So there is likely a lot of sharing. Now, these widths are big, and they represent a whole bunch of different ecoregions and different time periods. And that is contributing to the size of these niches and the overlap that you're seeing. And if we look at seasonal variability, let's say in mycid, and we have almost 300 samples, again, like you saw with the data that I presented from Annie, you see a decrease in M15 as the season goes along. So in the spring, delta M15 is nice and high. As we go, it decreases. There's also a significant reduction in carbon, but it's not quite as strong, and it's more influenced by ecoregion. This variation that you're seeing right here really reflects the different areas and ecoregions that are being um, uh, organized into. But in general, across ecoregions, you see this relationship. So really, if, if, you, if you compare between seasons, you're kind of comparing apples and oranges and stable isotopes. It doesn't mean that they're not feeding on the same thing, and that becomes a problem, but you need to consider this when you interpret your isotopes. And then this figure down on the right-hand side just shows you the isotope niches through time. And so you see that migration down of N15. The carbon sort of stays the same, but you see that change over so a lot of the variability that we saw in the mycid up here really reflected different seasons and ecoregions. And if we look at all the species together, um, one of the things to note is here's the blue, the zooplankton, and the particular matter seem to be more sensitive and change more across the seasons than benthic brown and the fish red. And that's probably due to the fact that fish live a little bit longer and incorporate different um, um, like the time of when they're eating, so they, they smear across seasons. And same with benthic invertebrates, not quite as much of a drastic change in the productivity that we see in the pelagic, so they don't quite see the same change in stable isotopes. If we look at different um, ecoregions, and again, this is for mycids, you can see the red, um, which I can't see on my screen, is the deep hole, and you see a lot of variability in, in that. Um, this is for one particular time in the spring, so we've eliminated seasonal differences. But you can see that the Niagara prune has a different than the out, 
outlet basin near Picton where the water's flowing up or the upwelling along the western uh, shore of, of Lake Ontario. So there's a lot of seasonal ver different spatial, sorry, spatial differences in stabilized topes between mice. Again, you got to consider these. Oops. So uh, what Don has done, and this is a preliminary analysis, is he's run some general linear models and he's pulled out the influence of day of the year that they were collected, the depth they were collected in the ecoregions. So what we've essentially done is sort of eliminated a lot of the variability that you see. And again, for Delta 13C and Delta 15N, you can see sort of a separation of the different species of, of zooplankton and benthic invertebrates and fish. They're, they're partitioning the resources within Lake Ontario, although there is quite a bit of overlap, but they can overlap on sort of different um, axes. So if we go down to Delta, Delta 15 and, and we look at Bosmani and, and Daphnia, we can see that Delta and 15 are pretty similar. They look to be herbaceous based on where they fit. But if you look at the carbon, the Daphnia seem to have more of a, a benthic signature, a littoral signature to the carbon, and their Bosminia have more of a pelagic signature. And so we're starting to look at these relationships to see how they, they tease apart. So what have we found, some key findings um, uh, from this work? <clears throat> well, first is with regards to stabilized to Delta 13C and Delta 15N exhibit cross-lake trends um, that are fairly consistent um, across lower trophic levels across the five Great Lakes and that there's consistent differences that are related to the trophic state, the latitude and the lake size, and that's good. That means that the mechanisms and processes that are driving the stabilized topes are probably fairly consistent between systems. We also see seasonal ecoregion and depth variation in these stabilized topes and these lower trophic levels. And, and that's important for, for interpreting what's going on in the system. Uh, you can't mix across seasons and you really can't mix across different ecoregions within Great Lakes within this group. And to take this further and up the food web, if you're looking at diets of fish or you're trying to understand the entire ecosystem or food web, you got to be careful about what you mix and what you look at. And this provides opportunity because if you see differences in some of your fish, you may be able to relate it to ecoregion use. Um, but it also confounds and makes it difficult to interpret these things. And I just want to point out some of the work done by Leggett and Servos and other people on Lake Ontario that saw a lot of this variation, both with season and a little bit with ecoregions. Um, and what we found is, is that in the lower trophic level organisms of Great Lakes, there is quite a bit of, of um, overlap in resource use. Um, but we also see uh, quite a bit of resource and habitat partitioning. And depending on how you interpret your stable isotopes, um, you can confound what's going on and you need to consider these things to really get at this. But it is still, using stable isotopes, difficult to tease out specific diet and trophic relationships. So if you try to run mixing models to understand the diet of these things, if a lot of your potential prey items have similar stable isotopes, you're not going to be able to, to uh, address those. Um, and, I, and just to put as a final note here, um, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission has a, a new theme called Ecosystem of Mammoths, so it's about five years old. And just recently, um, we've deemed that one of the biggest gaps, if not the biggest gaps in understanding food webs are, are these lower trophic levels. So we need to better understand what's going on with these lower trophic levels and better understand how stable isotopes will do that to understand this. Now, there are some new methods that I want to point out that are going to help us. So, um, one that I'm, I'm really excited about is work that John Burge is doing from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and Warren Curry and others from PFO. And they've developed a method using antibodies where you take invertebrates and you mix them up and you create a solution, you inject them into a rabbit. A rabbit creates antibodies that are reactive to that particular zooplankton. Um, and not getting into great details, and you can then use those antibodies and take an invertebrate that you're interested in grind them up and then compare them to the antibodies to see what they're looking at. So what this figure on the right is showing is for um, uh, pithotrepes and what they're eating, um, it's hard to look at what vertebrates are eating. Some contents are virtually impossible because they're so small. I've already talked about the issues with stable isotopes. What this method allows you to do is to grind up the species that you're interested in and then you put these antibodies against it and it gives you both a qualitative and a quantitative estimate of what they're eating. Um, and so what uh, John and, and others have done in this paper is they've looked at the actual abundance, um, which is the black bars based on survey work in Lake Michigan, and then compared to what bithotrepes is found using the antibody method. And what you see is, depending on the location, is that 
Mythotropics is being selective in what they're eating. This kind of detailed quantitative, um, what are you specifically eating for zooplankton in the Great Lakes is gonna be a game changer in my opinion. Um, and this research has a lot of potential to change our understanding of trophic levels. But I also wanna talk about some other things in Great Lakes um, with regards to stable isotopes. So <clears throat> if you're gonna use stable isotopes, and a lot of us do to look at uh, trophic relationships in freshwater food webs or really any food one, you gotta consider the variation that you see uh, spatially and seasonally within your species, but you also have to consider how you use the stable isotopes. You must correct for organism stable isotope baseline to make any sense out of where a species is eating or where their carbon source is, and not just for delta N15 for trophic position. You've got to consider your turnover leg times across organism species. You know, the stable isotopes in, a, in an old large lake choke probably reflect its feeding over at least a year or maybe longer, whereas for something like Daphne, it may only be a few days or a week. And then just real quick is variation in diet tissue discrimination factor. And these can scale with the value of, of, of the isotope in your diet. Um, and we've done quite a bit of work on this and I'll, I'll quickly explain it. Um, since the 90s, we've been, I've been doing work on changing the, uh, the stable isotope value in the food of an organism and looking at the stable isotope diet tissue discrimination factor. So remember, this is how much the stable isotope changed between a prey and the consumer, between the predator and a prey. And if you can vary the delta 13C and delta 15N in its food and keep the food consistent, which is harder than it seems, what you find is that there's really strong relationships uh, with diet tissue discrimination factor and isotope value in the food. So as your isotope value gets larger and larger, your diet tissue discrimination factor decreases. And then we've used this to apply to food webs to look at what is uh, going So what it means is if you use a constant diet tissue discrimination factor, which 99.9% .9 of food web studies have done, um, you assume that every 3.2 in delta N15 means a neutrophic position. Under the scaled scenario, your diet tissue discrimination factor should get smaller and smaller as you move up food webs. And this paper that we had in Ecology Letters showed that we were underestimating the trophic position of top trophic level organisms because they were falling out in the wrong locations. So for example, in the Great Lakes, and this is for Lake Huron, this is data from 2008 that Tim and I have and others have. If you use an additive DTDF of 3.2 and you scale up, and what we have here is plankton, mycid, alewife, rainbow smelt, round goby, and lake trout, you would assume that the trophic position of the lake trout is five, which is probably unrealistic. If you scale it so you can see the big jump between trophic level two and three is big because the, the delta N15 is small and then it gets smaller and smaller, your assessment of the trophic position of the lake trout is more around 4.5 or maybe 4.4. That makes a little bit more sense didn't work on Lake Ontario, we actually had the opposite effect. But again, the, the plankton is much higher in Lake Ontario when we were working here. Um, so using these scaled uh, DTTFs is something I think we might want to consider. And uh, just recently, Brent Iwaki, a, a former grad student in Press Now, took some data in the Detroit River and used both the scaled and constant method. And you can see on the right the differences between um, using a scale and a constant, we looked at single and dual different carbon and compared to the stomach contents. And, and what we found was is that using a scale DTEF um, was really better for having variable uh, baseline values, um, gave a, a tighter estimate of, of, of um, the actual value, and, and in general was closer to the stomach content. So something you might want to consider. The message again is, is as we use stable isotopes, um, we have to be careful about how we interpret them. So just to summarize and um, summarize what I've talked about in, the, in, in this today, um, definitely for, for future research in the Great Lakes and you know with the environmental changes that we're experiencing, um, we need to better understand the Great Lakes food webs. Um, there's definitely new methods coming online for more quantitative and qualitative assessment of trophic relationships. So I talked about the antibody work that John Birch and and, and Warren Curry are pushing. Um, there's Delta 34S, another isotope that gives different uh, information than carbon or nitrogen, and compound specific stable isotopes is another example. Um, we need these things and we need to be able to, to, to use them properly to get a better me mechanistic understanding of chemical tracer dynamics. And then, and then conversely, to get a better understanding of, of food web relationships. I would argue um, 
we need to have a better understanding of the lower trophic level, trophic level relationships and structure. Um, as I said, GLFC has identified that uh, now as an important component of their ecosystem dynamic uh, theme, funding theme. Um, we can't improve on ecosystem models such as Ecopath unless we have a better understanding of these trophic relationships. Um, and when you look at a lot of the Ecopath models that have been done in the Great Lakes, and a lot of them are successful, they often lump nearshore and offshore zooplankton or invertebrates together. Um, we feel that if we have a better understanding of that, more specific understanding, that will make better models. Other things which I really haven't talked about today, uh, I think we need to consider spatial subsidies within the Great Lakes. Um, these are large systems, and we know that organisms, particularly fish, move around. Uh, the acoustic telemetry work that's uh, been done by the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observing has clearly shown us that fish move around a lot more than we thought. Um, and that has implications about where they're feeding and where they're getting resources and where they're bringing resources. Um, and we also need to consider the seasonal trends in that and how those things happen. I think we need to give greater consideration to the environmental parameters and environmental change that is occurring within these systems. And I say vice versa too, because oftentimes when we talk about nutrient dynamics within a lake, we often don't consider the fish and what they're doing and the nitrogen and phosphorus that they're moving around and holding. Um, and that's something that needs to be looked at more closely. And then, of course, we need to incorporate what we learn about food web dynamics into management and conservation. And, and that also falls on those of us who are doing the food web release, uh, research. We need to do research that um, and come to conclusions and develop models and ideas that take things like stable isotopes and give them usable information to the managers and people making conservation uh, decisions for this. Okay, I'm tired. Um, so I will say thank you, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Aaron. That was a, a great talk, uh, really interesting. And I also want to congratulate you that you maxed out our webinar capacity. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone out there hears from a colleague that um, they were not able to get in, we'll be posting the recording on the Sigler website um, probably in the next week or so, but you'll get everybody that registered for the webinar will get a uh, kind of an automatic email, but we've put the link uh, to the page where the video will be posted um, uh, it just as soon as we can. So it, just if anyone says that. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, please, uh, anybody that's out there with a question, enter them in the chat box and I will uh, read them. So our first question is from John Bratton, and he asks, does change in nitrogen species through seasons also impact zooplankton isotopes? For example, nitrate and runoff early to recycled N and ammonium. Yeah, that, yeah that's an excellent question. And that's a perfect example of, of and a more specific example of um, understanding better environmental variability and what it means for stable isotopes. So um, you can do stable isotopes of nitrate. Scott Mundell, who's a faculty member at the University of Windsor, does these kinds of things. And I, I think that is where we need to move to better understand where the nitrogen and, and food webs is coming from. Um, so when you do look at nitrate um, stable isotopes, you see, do see variation and it doesn't, it can tell you about where that nitrate originated. Um, I don't know what the direct relationship is between um, zooplankton and delta N15, at least from the research that we've done. There may be stuff going on that I don't know about, um, but that's certainly one of the questions that we're hoping to get at in the next couple of years as, as we improve our ability to do nitrate stabilized tubs. Great question. John, I just unmuted you if you um, had any follow-up questions to that. Yeah, I'm not sure how well my mic is working, but. Um... We can hear you. I, I know there are these these seasonal changes or uh, other things like either uh, uh, nitrogen fixing, um, cyanos that kick in, or um, you know, in hypoxic systems, you've got uh, denitrification going on. So, th so I guess it depends how strong those signals are, whether they propagate all the way up at least to the the zooplankton. But the, that's what I had in mind. I've, I've seen things like this in more in preserved sediment. Um, over time in a eutrophying system like in Chesapeake Bay. Yeah, I, I, I think excellent points, John, and I, and I think that probably explains a lot of what's going on in Lake Erie. 
So, and the differences that we see between systems, those are sort of the mechanisms and things that I think we need to have a better handle on. But I, I think you're you're totally correct about that. And then not only does it affect how we trace the, and the nitrogen through the system, I think it raises also questions about what it means for the food web itself beyond just being able to trace and look at the ice kelps. What does it mean for the, you know, the efficiency, the trophic efficiency between trophic levels? What does it mean for, you know, wh where nitrogen is coming from and the quality of that nitrogen and resources um, are also, you know, the, the, the play out of what that means for food webs. So yeah, yeah, totally agree. Okay. Great, thank you. And we have another question from Kyle K, who is asking um, if the Dracaena species that were sampled and analyzed, if they were zebra mussels or quagga mussels. Oh, good question. And I, I, I think generally they're probably quagga mussels um, because they're, they're they're more common. Probably it would depend on where exactly the samples were collected and what's going on. Uh, we tended to lump those together, and we should probably take a closer look at that. Um, but I, I think in general, particularly for Lake, Lake Ontario and that, I'm, I'm assuming it's, it's quagga mussels. Okay, thank you. I'm not seeing anything else um, right now in the chat box. So if somebody else, we can pause for a minute here and see if um, something else comes up. Or you can also just raise, um, hit uh, the hand raise uh, button. If it's easier to do that and I can unmute you. I wonder if the, the, the high high attendance rate for this reflects the fact that we've run out of TV to watch. I don't know. We can only speculate, right? <laughs> okay, we have another one popping up from John. He asks, are gobies impacting fish isotopes through time? assuming we have a time series of fish isotope data. Yeah, so um, I'll talk about Lake Ontario because we've done quite a bit of work there. Um, uh, yeah, um, the goby, gobies have affected the lake trout state based on uh, data we see. And it's interesting because if you look at just the summer contents from the summer when I think they're probably focused on IL life, you don't see it. But when you look at state isotope value, we're more and more seeing a shift um, to more of a, a goby benthic site, uh, delta 13C and delta 15N. So we have a couple of papers from a few years ago, um, Gord Patterson and Scott Rush um, worked on that. So the isotopes are, are suggesting white trout have, have keyed in on, on, on uh, goby, yeah. Thank you. No more questions at this point. We'll give another pause to see if something pops up because we have a few minutes. Um, okay, I don't see anything coming on my screen and I also don't see any hands up. Um, okay. So, oh, wait a second. Okay, John, I'm just gonna unmute you, okay? <laughs> We have one more from John Bratton, and I'm going to let him ask his question. <laughs> Nobody's asking questions. Uh, Go ahead. Feel free. We've got time. <laughs> you know, Aaron, I know you work with fish acoustics as well as isotopes. Uh, do you see, uh, you know, interaction among those different data gathering exercises? Yeah, so that's um, one of the areas that, you know, uh, my group and Tim's group is moving toward um, is can we take stable isotopes and, and look at how they're, um, you know, like sample a fish that we're going to put acoustic telemetry tag into and then look at their what they do. Um, we're kind of in the infancy of that, but I can give you one example. So Brent Naraki is, is, works for Tim now, but he was a master student of mine. He looked at top predators in the Detroit River. And what we saw was really large isotopic niche for both and uh, much larger than the other um, top predators like largemouth bass and muskie and those kinds of things. And so one of the questions we had is, well, what is this? Is it because they move around more? Or they don't move as round as much? And so we've done work and we're just starting to get the papers out now where we compared uh, largemouth bass in Detroit River versus bowfin movements. And really what we're finding is, is that the bowfin move around less over the course of a year than a lake trout. 
And so we think, for example, and then we think what this is telling us is, is that they're probably feeding more in more smaller zones and than um, largemouth bass. And and I, I think what that means is they're not necessarily you know feeding differently. They just get into different regions of the Detroit River, which have slightly different. There's quite a bit of even within the Detroit River over a kilometer, you can see quite a bit of variability in stable isotopes. So I think what ends up happening is they stay in the same area and they reflect the play in those different areas, whereas largemouth bass seem to be moving around a little bit more, incorporating more very, uh, more similar items. So we are starting to look at those interplays between how they move around and, and their stabilized up signatures. But it definitely is, is where we kind of want to go. And, we're starting to do that and, and, and trying to start to do that in Lake Erie, for example, compare stabilized stubs and walleye, which move around quite a bit, uh, versus yellow perch, which don't move around, and trying to combine the two to understand those spatial subsidies. subsidies. I think that's going to be you know, a, a nice way that isotopes and, and telemetry are going to work together. And the nice thing about stabilized stubs is you don't have to kill the fish to get a sample. Um, you can take biopsies. Um, a fin and blood and do those kinds of things. And I, I think that's going to have a lot of potential to help us understand, you know, you know, how important that movement and spatial subsidies are. You know, that's, that's super interesting because it suggests if you wanted to monitor something like say, uh, you know, uptake of toxins by fish over time, once you've done some remediation, you might want to look at bowfin over, you know, a bass or something else that moves around a little bit more and integrates more. Yeah, that's a great thought, John. Yeah, exactly. And I and I I think again, that's a that's a perfect example of how you could use that that kind of data to to help with management. Yeah, great idea, John. Yeah. And, and conversely too, I think if we know how much they move around, that'll that'll impact things like bioenergetics. That's another area that uh, um, we're trying to get into as well. Graham Raby's uh, leading quite a bit of that. He's a new faculty member at Trent now and. You know, if we understand where the fish are, we understand what they're eating, we understand the temperatures and stuff, we can start to do better bioenergetic modeling, uh, combining those techniques and, 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 and getting a better understanding, which, which should improve ecopath and ecosyn models and things like that and Atlantis. And, and again, I, given that things are getting warmer in the Great Lakes and temperatures are changing and we're seeing differences, those are important things to be doing right now to, to make sure that our management is as effective as it can be. Keep up. Oh. Sorry, John, I accidentally muted you prematurely. Were you trying to say one more thing? <laughs> no, I was just saying keep up the good work. Oh, <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so we have a, a follow-up question from Kyle K regarding um, bivalves. He said he's not sure if any other bivalves were used but wondering if there are any comparisons or differences between native bivalves and introduced or invasive dracaenid mussels in terms of food and habitat resource uses. I don't know. I, I can't answer that. I haven't looked at that. I mean, by the time I was working on <laughs> webs in the Great Lakes, we were mainly collecting dracaenids. And I'll be honest, um, we dracaenids are so easy to collect, um, and they give us—they really give you more of a pelagic signature than a benthic, and they're just so convenient. So um, I'm not thinking enough about the, the bivalves. It, we're really—I'm using them as a fish person, unfortunately, Kyle. So I, I can't help you with that at this point. I have to go look. Sorry. But, but I do I do think it's important. I mean, I, those kinds of things and better understanding differences within dracinids. I'm sure we're oversimplifying what's going on um, spatially, seasonally, between species, um, all kinds of things in there. There's got to be more complexity to what's going on there. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you, Aaron. And um, I'm not seeing any other questions pop up. So um, I'm going to thank you for a wonderful presentation and uh, discussion afterward, Aaron. Really appreciate your presenting to everybody today. And thank you to everybody who attended. Um, we're, we used to um, really enjoy having these um, in person at NOAA Glural and then also hosting on the web. And uh, here we are in our virtual world and doing things differently. So it's great to see a, a good turnout and that we've got um, people still engaged in uh, our seminar series. So thanks everybody and have a wonderful afternoon.